Okay, so I'll start by introducing you. Um, so we're delighted to have Professor Patrick Kavanaugh with us today in our seminar. Professor Kavanaugh has a B in engineer in electrical engineering from McGill University. He then continued to do an MSc and a PhD in psychology at CMU under the supervision of Bill Chase. He was affiliated during his research and doing his research in university in the University of Montreal, Harvard University, Université mm -hmm. Paris, mm -hmm. Paris mm -hmm. Um, Dartmouth College and Glen uh, College at um, York University. These included working on memory and vision and vision research and setting up the Laboratory of Perception at the University de Montreal, founding and co-directing together with Ken Kayama, the Vision <laughs> Sciences <laughs> Laboratory. Just a second, I'm going to, I'm not sure who is, um... sorry. Okay, founding and co-directing together with Ken Nakayama, the Vision Sciences Laboratory at Harvard, um, creating the Center of Attention and Vision to focus on attention research at the University, pa University Paris Descartes, which led to winning um, the Chair d'Excellence and an ERC Advance Grant. He is now a research professor at Dartmouth College and a senior uh, research fellow at Glendon College of uh, York University. He has trained dozens of postdocs, dozens of PhD students and master's students, which have um, uh, many of them have continued to lead a successful scientific career and hold university positions in prestigious institutes across the world as Berkeley, Brown, Yale, Vanderbilt, Dartmouth, Tokyo, Sydney, and others. Many of his students have won prestigious prizes at, um, as the VSS Young Investigators Award as the Fulbright Scholarships for PhD, Marie Curie Postdoc Fellowships, the Dutch Vinny Award and others. He serves in many scientific committees, is the editor and in the editorial board of multiple vision, perception and psychology journals. He has an H index of 78, more than 25,000 citations published in top journals as Nature, Science, Nature Neuroscience, Neuron and others received many honors and prestigious awards and grants. And without further ado, I'd like to welcome you, Patrick, to our seminar to hear about your exciting work. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you for all the ado. <clears throat> I was very generous. <clears throat> okay, so I would like to take you through a tour of our work on um, uh, the effects of motion on uh, position. So you should be seeing our uh, slide screen here. And um, actually before uh, <clears throat> I start showing you the, the research, um, I would like you to uh, uh, get some extra movies because the movies on Zoom don't play very well and, and movies are very critical for what I'll show you. So let's go and set up your movies. So first of all, you for those of you who haven't done it already, you need to get out of the full screen Zoom mode. So press escape or double click on this slide and that will get you out. Hang on, I'm uh, checking on it. There we go. Um, escape, there we go, okay. <clears throat> now um, go look in your chat window and I'll give you the address for the movies. Here it is. So everybody should see that um, ooh, with a capital H. I hope that doesn't matter. So if you double click on that uh, from your uh, address in the chat window, it should open a website for you. So it's not, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to be a, a, a participant as well. I'm doing the same thing. Okay, now you have your um, movie window. Now take a while for the movies to load. Don't worry about that. <clears throat> uh, so shrink that window down so you can have your two windows or if you're really uh, luxurious so you can have two monitors with one window in each. Um, and at some point the little uh, spinning wheel will stop and those movies will be ready but we won't need them for a moment yet. Okay and now if you if that link didn't work here is the link on the bottom here uh, which uh, either you didn't see it or you got in a bit late. Um, anyways, it's that if you type all of that in, uh, you'll get to the same, you'll get the same uh, website open. Okay, <clears throat> so 
Uh, well, this is a brain. I think most of you are familiar with the brain. Uh, and uh, thanks to uh, Mel uh, Goodale and others, we think of it as two pathways, a what pathway, uh, which is where most research goes on. I think you'll have to admit in, in vision, uh, what things are, vision, you know, recognizing faces, uh, reading, um, objects, recognition, and the where pathway. And that's where we're gonna focus today because the where is kind of even more fundamental than what, if you think about it for a moment, you occasionally see things briefly and you can tell me where they are, but you can't tell me what they are. And anytime you actually see something, it it's localized, it's well localized. So uh, the where is kind of the matrix within which we have our subjective experience. And I think aware um, research about where and how that works is an interesting window, important window onto how the visual system works. So how do we know where things are? Well, we know a lot about this. Uh, we think of it kind of uh, already given every receptive field. And here's a recording from a cell in the visual cortex. Uh, and it only responds to a certain small area on, the, on a screen of images presented in front of the eyeball. <clears throat> That's its receptive field. So each, uh, each unit really in the visual system comes with a, a built-in code of where its stimulus is. Uh, and you might think that's, well, that's fine. That's enough to know where things are, but it's not so easy. Uh, one problem is, well, targets can be moving or your eyes can be moving. And why would that be a problem? The real problem is that there's a delay between when the information arrives on your retina and when it arrives in your awareness. That's about a 10th of a second. That doesn't seem like much. But a car moving or a tennis ball, you know, at a uh, uh, hundred meters per second, that's pretty fast. Let's say, yeah, hundred meters per second. No, that's not fast. That's about standard, uh, uh, kind of a weak uh, tennis serve. So in a tenth of a second, it moves ten meters, which is a fair amount of distance, to be off. So your vision be off by about a tenth of a second for something moving at that speed, and many things are moving in our field of view. So we. We imagine that vision somehow has had to deal with this for us to still be surviving. And the point is motion is here to help us, to help predict the present, to make up for these delays and other things as well, as we'll show. So the idea is that we don't just measure where things are, even though our receptive fields kind of do that, but there's a, a much more important step that follows it where we construct where things are. So that, here's the point, the position is constructed and it's like color. Think of the example of color and color constancy where you have to discount the illuminant. Or maybe if you're like a social psychologist, you might think of the same idea when you judge people's intentions by discounting the context. Well, we won't go there, but anyways, here's, here's the color constancy case. So look at this, this little corner of this cube and this corner of that cube are in fact the exact same uh, wavelengths being emitted by your monitor. They are identical. And yet this, within the context of a reddish kind of illumination, looks blue-green. And this, within some apparently greenish illumination, looks reddish. Here's just to show you that they are the same. They are identical. Um, so the point is, uh, of course, we're not going to look at color. Uh, but that's a nice example that you're, you're familiar with. We're going to look at the case of motion. And the idea is si very similar, that we have to, the brain somehow reads the motion and compensates for it, uses it either to predict where things are now or to uh, discount the motion of the background. We'll see a few examples. So um, in fact, we're going to look at three illusions, three different illusions to understand how position is coded. And you might say, well, why illusions? That's kind of... Those are fun, but what do they do for, what have illusions ever done for us? Well, in fact, they're gonna do two really important things. One is, well, of course, mechanism. How did that happen at all? And go back to the two colors here. How does that happen? If you wanted to understand color constancy, you'd start with this and figure out what the mechanism is, that's fine. But even more important is uh, anatomy. Where does this happen? So think about it a bit. Up here, we have these two cubes, boom, uh, two corners of the cubes. And at the retina, the, the activity is identical for the two uh, areas. 
you go up, let's say the lateral genetic kit, it's still identical. Uh, V1, uh, first area of visual cortex, still identical, but boom, somewhere they become different. They become differently perceived colors. And that place is where the data underlying perception, that's where um, the, the magic happens. So that's what the illusion gives us, especially with position, as you'll see, you have a perceived position, which is quite different from the retinal position, somewhere that difference emerges and we'll be able to track the anatomy of that by looking at these illusions. Okay, so let's start with a really simple example <clears throat> of the moving target that you're gonna uh, make an eye movement to. So something moves by and you're gonna move your, you're gonna jump with your eyes to that moving target. And that in fact is pretty accurate. So surprisingly so, pretty much independently of the speed, as long as it's not too fast, your eye gets right to the target, you move to it and land right on it. That implies that the eye, the eye movement system uh, understands the motion of the, of the target and knows the delay that's going to between landing on the retina where that motion is measured and uh, the uh, computation of where to go and the time delay it takes for the eyes to get there. All that is worked out. Now you could say, the visual system might correct for the motion by aiming ahead of the target. You know, you know this target's moving, so you're gonna have to just shoot ahead of it. That's the condition that we see in skeet shooting. You may, may be familiar with skeet shooting. You have a shotgun with some uh, pellet in it, some large shot, and you're gonna hit this little moving guy here called a clay pigeon. And you have to aim ahead and there's nothing there. You can see that the gun is aiming in blank space, but the, the marksman knows to have to aim ahead and gets it because it you know, took some time to get there. Uh, now that's with clay pigeons. Uh, if, you, if you ever watch uh, Top Gear like I used to do, you see another example with cars. Here it is. Pull! Here comes the car. Well, so same idea. Now, it, so if you're in the skeet shooting mode, you would somehow correct the direction. Imagine your eye movements are correcting for direction, but looking at nothing, just kind of knowing it's going to be there. That's the skeet shooting mode. In fact, it doesn't work like that. The visual system appeared to make a virtual target. It's at the right location. It's already made this extrapolation. It incorporates the correction explicitly to correct for the delay. And you can see that in the activity of the, of the saccade control centers. Uh, and the assumption is that perception does the same extrapolation, so they keep in step, and both of them predict the present together. <clears throat> so if you want a really good example of that, um, well, Rafa Nadal didn't play in Wimbledon. He did play and unfortunately lost in um, Roland Garros, the French Open, but he's pretty good. Now look at his eyes and watch the ball. Okay. Boom. Uh, you watch, well, he's paid a lot for this. So, but uh, notice the, notice, that's kind of fun. Okay, notice back here, watch. All the way along, his eyes were pointing right at the ball. Now just think about that for a second. He's looking right at the ball, but it takes a 10th of a second for um, all these signals to get to his awareness. So he's like a zombie. He's staring at the space where the ball should be and there's a whole set of predictions made a tenth of a second ago uh, when the ball was uh, three meters away um, or further. And, and he's made a prediction of where to look right now. And he, he's aiming at it, he's got it right on. So, so a matter of fact, most people who play tennis can do this pretty well. So he's got this prediction. Uh, and the idea is also that his perception has also made the prediction. He's seeing a ball here. He, he's not feeling he's looking in empty space. Uh, he's seeing a ball here, and it's actually the ball that he picked up a tenth of a second ago without the current spin, for example. So there's some pretty sophisticated computations going on here. Um, <clears throat> so the idea is the motion makes a target appear ahead of its actual path. Um, okay, well, hang on. My movies didn't start. Uh, 
I hope other people's movies started. Oh, there um, we go. Yeah, my movie. Some, yeah, I they know. work. Anyways, okay, mine worked. Some, some error. I'm writing the whole thing on a side computer just to be sure of what you're seeing. So, okay, this is web movie number one. So you can move to your movie uh, screen, your separate movie screen. This is going to show some of the examples of how motion uh, predicts and creates a perception in advance of its actual location. Um, now on your, on your web movie, uh, you can click on the motion drag one and it'll, it should start. And um, you should see the, the top and bottom. I'll do it here on this version. <clears throat> to see the top and bottom, Gabor is kind of approaching and spreading apart. If you wanted to use a ruler to see, they're always uh, exactly vertically aligned, but they seem to be pulled apart and um, squished together by their internal motion. Uh, now, if you click on the next guy, the flash lag, you'll see the second version. And the flash lag is a, is a very famous example, uh, studied by several here, I'm sure. And um, the point is you look in the center and you, as soon as the red flashes occur, you're supposed to judge where the moving edge is. Um, so here's the slow and jerky version here. Oh, and I, I moved ahead to it. Oh, with the look, I didn't show you the look, but anyway, here's the flash. Oops, sorry. So many things going on. Okay, so here's the flash lag that you're maybe looking at. Um, so the point is the edge, the moving edge appears to be ahead of where the flash was. Well, that's a bit um, uh, uh, hard to um, deal with because you have two things you do. You have to detect the flash and then you have to look for the motions that may account for that. So in fact, we, uh, Stuart Ansis and I, um, started looking at uh, a more direct measure of these motion effects. And that's in your next movie. So you can just click on the black background and you get the next movie. And it should start on its own. So you don't have to click on it. Now, if you do click on it and get to the wrong one by mistake, you can uh, do your uh, back left key to get to, to move back in the web movie, or you can move your cursor over to the left edge of the movie uh, window and you'll see all of the movies and you can jump to the one you want. Okay, so now we're on movie number two uh, with Stuart, that's Stuart on the left. <clears throat> now those two uh, lines are vertical and uh, parallel, uh, but the motion in the background starts off and tilts them one way or the other. Uh, and, and that gives you a real feeling for the, the uh, power of these illusions because the retinal stimulation is way over here, boom, like that up on top, but the physical, uh, uh, physical stimulus is in there. So a couple of degrees, they're not even overlapping. It's a couple of degrees apart and definitely a target for fMRI studies, which, we, which I won't show you, but which we have done and show that effect. Okay. <clears throat> oh, and a second one. Okay, so now you can uh, click on the background and get to your word, web movie number three, which will, again will start on its own. Um, sorry for this back and forth, but Zoom does have some limitations. Now, what you should see are two squares, a red square and a blue square. Uh, this is again with Stuart Anstis, uh, Master of Illusions. And the two squares might appear to have different sizes to you, when in fact they are identical in size. You can uh, put your finger on one of them or try to, uh, just to show yourself that they are identical. So the motion, in both cases, the, the flashing uh, uh, lines on the rotating background, and on this case, with expanding and contracting, the flash uh, is somehow being uh, bound to the motion. So the visual system feels that the flash is part of the moving structure and tries to predict where it would be given the normal delays in uh, and, and reaching awareness. And that, <clears throat> that change in um, position is what you're seeing as a change in size here for the two squares. Okay, so those are uh, pretty powerful illusions. And um, um, come back here, there we go. So we're, we certainly follow uh, Nijiwan and now um, Henze Hegendorn, who's really picked up this uh, extrapolation um, concept that the visual system is extrapolating the target to where it will be. And this is a position offset. I mean, you call it an illusion, but it's a very useful offset. It's well established for eye movements. In other words, this does happen to direct your eyes to a target. We can see it happening 
in the frontal eye fields, where a third of the cells code the landing location of the saccad, not the actual retinal location of the target. And the same in the superior colliculus. Uh, here's some uh, help for you there. This, this is where the frontal eye fields in the frontal cortex, the superior colliculus is down below. And the, uh, in, in the, um, the parial, posterior parietal area controlling saccades is about here. So all these, these seem to be involved. And you can also see this kind of offset in the area of visual four with uh, Christy Sunderberg and John Reynolds and Miles Fala did this and showed that the response to a, a, the preferred color flash as it moved into the visual, into the receptive field versus out was shifted in space by about the same amount as the perceived um, illusion. Okay, so you've got the idea. The, the brain tries to predict um, offsets given the, uh, ooh, I want to turn this off here. It's annoying having all this motion. Okay, so I pressed the pause button on my movie web, web movie thing. Okay, so eye movements. If you think this is involved in the positions of the illusion that we see, you might think, well, people with slower eye movements should have a larger um, uh, perceptual illusion if the illusion is really trying to compensate for, for the delays before the eye can get to the target. When people who are slower to do that should have larger illusions. And with L. Van Heusden and Hinze Hegendorn, <clears throat> We're able to show exactly that. So the longer saccade latency, the larger the perceived shift. Uh, so she had, first of all, a, a stimulus a bit like this, where the target was uh, shifted by the background motion, even though on Zoom, you may not see this very well. <clears throat> and the, the saccades show the same kind of error as the perception does. And what's key here is her result, the people with slow saccades had larger uh, perceptual errors, making that link between the saccad system the timing, the compensation, and the perceptual illusion. So for this simple motion case, perception, attention, eye movements, I haven't shown you the EEG or fMRI here, but they all show similar extrapolation for this just forward motion seen ahead of where it is. And they all predict a shift of about a tenth of a second. Position shift scales with speed. If it goes faster, you see it farther ahead and so on. So based on this, you might think, well, hey, the saccade system may be this higher level uh, um, mechanism that's uh, coding uh, where things are for us. Uh, we would be wrong, but uh, we'd certainly get that idea from this uh, research uh, until we started doing this study on what we call the double drift, something that um, Peter T and uh, uh, Art Shapiro had noticed before. This is with Matteo Lisi, who's now at the University of Essex. Uh, so if you look at this uh, uh, spot, uh, the question is, where's, what's the path of the moving Gabor? So back to your web movies, um, flip forward to web movie number three, I think it is, four. Okay, web movie number four, and it'll go start on its own. Mm, okay, well, mine didn't because I went there. Okay, click on it to start if you need to. <clears throat> now, the point is when you're looking at the fixation spot, you should see a uh, probably sort of vertical path of the Gabor going up and down. Pretty convincing. Well, some of you may see a bit to right, tilted to the right, but the left, but mostly vertical. If you go look at the Gabor on the other hand, you'll see that it has an oblique path. And at the top of that path, the, dis the distance between the physical and the perceived path is enormous. Uh, it's quite striking. Um, and even though we have this huge effect on perception, it does not affect our eye movements. This is so an illusion that affects uh, perception, but not gaze. So the saccades are special. So this is what Matteo did. He took a task, he, just like that one there, he presented a tilted path that it nevertheless appeared vertical and had subjects saccade to it to find out where the saccade system thought that was. Well, here's the control. This is without the illusion. So the Gabor moves obliquely uh, and looks to move obliquely. So that's its real path and its perceived path. And here's where the saccades land. They fall kind of uh, you know, triggered at different points of time. They fall along a path that is parallel to the, to the actual path. But in the double drift case, where it's perceived to go vertically, and you might think the saccades would land vertically, they do not. They land pretty much identically to the control case. There is absolutely no effect in this uh, experiment of the illusion on eye movements. So what is that? 
Uh, so CAD's going the physical path unaffected by illusion, uh, similar to something Mel Liddell had suggested before that, that uh, action is, can be separate, can have a separate perceptual system from, um, from, from perception. Um, this turns out to be true only for reflexive saccades, memory saccades, pointing, everything else goes to the perceived path, but uh, these immediate saccades that are programmed while the stimulus is present are immune to the illusion, as if there's a second brain uh, that's perceiving this differently from the other, from our perceptual brain. Okay, so this produces, this, this motion produces a sideways shift of the target. And really unusually in all of the field of motion illusions, it, it accumulates over one to two seconds, not a tenth of a second, like the uh, Devaloy case. So this doesn't seem to really be a, a, a useful. This is like an error. It's some overcorrected and uncalibrated. Is this some glitch? Just because there are really not many objects in the world that move and have their own internal motion. I think maybe cuttlefish might be the only example I can think of. <clears throat> so we haven't calibrated our visual system to this. So perception shifts, but the eye movements and attention are, are not fooled. Um, and that's what we've uh, sort of tracked down over uh, many different um, experiments. So locations from the eye movements, well, first of all, let's give up on that first idea that locations from the eye movement system are in the final stage of location in the brain. That's just not the case, because here we have a dissociation. And what I'll show you now is the final stage is actually outside the visual system. It's in the frontal lobes. The first thing we did was with Sandrine Kemla and Fredo Chavan in Marseille. Uh, with optical recording uh, of a, from a monkey in a, a macaque in V1, a little window to, down to the left of fixation. So here's that window. The fixation would have been over here. Uh, the Gabor pattern is going to move through about this angle. And one of them will be the illusion case, this one. It's going to go like this, but the illusion, if it were, would produce a pattern that way. Here's the control, the static Gabor going up, up to the left again. Uh, like that. And movies are very fuzzy. This is optical recording, uh, but you kind of get the idea. And, and in each case, there's a little uh, black circle or a white cross that tracks the centroid of the activity. And then over here is the path of um, the centroid uh, across many trials, with black being the illusion trials and the control, uh, white being the control trials. And if we do a, a regression through those, of course, well, they both kind of line up here, even though the illusion should have been over there. So this is evidence that this illusion doesn't, even though it's very powerful, it just doesn't show up in V1. And that's kind of striking because uh, every other illusion we know of can be also detected in V1 because of attention, you know, broadcasting to V1 where it expects the target to be. So we have some clues here. Double drift uh, doesn't seem to have any downward projections of, of attention to V1. Um, at the expected at the perceived location. So our conclusion is that attention like saccades is immune to the illusion. Attention actually follows the perceived, not the perceived, but the physical location um, like that. And that means, in fact, now we can really do the test I mentioned to begin with, where we track through the visual system and find out where perception emerges. Where does the illusion, the perceived location differ, start to differ from the physical location? Well, that uh, optical imaging is uh, a measure that reflects blood oxygenation, just like fMRI. So we'll go to fMRI and expect something similar. This is with Sirei uh, uh, Liu and uh, Ching Yu, Peter C and myself. Um, with the, the stimulus just moving up and down, uh, as you saw, uh, oh no, you saw the reverse. It was going obliquely and it looked up and down, but here we're having it go up and down and the perceived path is either to the right, uh, sorry, to the left, or to the right, depending on the internal motion, but the perceived paths are identical. I'm sorry, the physical paths are identical. The perceived path is either left or right. Uh, and here's the uh, two, um, uh, the uh, brain here. This is the uh, pole. So this is the, the, the uh, medial view and this is the lateral view. These are the, um, the areas of interest. This is V1, uh, V2, V3, and MT. And here's the classification. So what is that? So we, we look at the pattern of activity in each area as all sorts of voxels uh, responding at different levels. 
and we present and we take all the trials where the, the path uh, was vertical, of course, but look left. And we take all those and then we compare them to all of uh, the trials where it was vertical, but look right and find out what, uh, what computation differentiates the left versus the right trials. And we do that on 90% of the trials, leaving over one tenth of them and test on that. Here's that result. How well do you classify left versus right perceived tilt based on the uh, training of the trials? How well do you do on the remaining 10%? Well, in V1, you don't do well at all. Now, V2, V3, a little bit, 60%. Uh, that's reasonable, uh, and we think it has something to do with the local motion. MT, not much. What happens though if you did that same experiment uh, training on left and right physical tilts, the, the trials where the, the stimulus had no internal motion but was physically tilted at the angle that matched the perceived tilt here? Well, here you do really well. Okay, so the, these signals are very strong um, indication of whether it's left or right in V1, V2, V3, and also V MT, it went even a bit less. But that's only the start. The really interesting part is when you look throughout the entire brain to see which parts share the common coding for orientation for the path, whether it's perceived and an illusion or whether it's physical, and not an illusion. So here's how you do that. You train this uh, teaching the algorithm. It's going to differentiate left for right. You train it on physical rightward and physical leftward, and we know it does very well on those in those early areas, as you saw. And now we test on uh, trials that are illusory, so they're actually vertical, but they look left or right, matched angles to the ones you trained with. And you do this in little patches all around the brain, so that's why it's called sort of a searchlight, slash light, whatever you like to call it. Okay, so here's what happens. Now remember, this successful de cross decoding indicates a common representation for the illusory and physical path, and tells you where perception emerges. And here's what we get. So here's the brain, a couple of views, bottom view, uh, lateral views, uh, medial views. Now look at the red circles. That's the visual areas. And basically there's nothing there. So vision does not know this path. The, that, the path is not represented in the visual areas. Where is it represented? Uh, in these areas, frontal areas, a couple of others, but mostly frontal, uh, and makes the kind of, Heretical suggestion that the uh, realization of, of perceived location is something computed outside the visual system, something we would have to come back to in more research later. But that's the point. So, con conscious perception of location computed outside the visual system. Attention, uh, luckily, attention didn't project to the expected perceived locations in early visual cortex, as it does with almost everything else. So, this particular illusion is unique because it doesn't drive saccades and by consequence we don't think it drives attention either and that lets us gives us a little breathing room so it prevents attention from broadcasting the perceived locations everywhere and messing up our attempt to find where perceived uh, location emerges that doesn't happen here and we can see that the perceived location um, emerges oops very late and that attention is independent of perception Okay, those are the first two illusions. The first one was uh, useful. It seemed to help the saccades at least and, and perception followed along in knowing where things are when they're moving. The second one is kind of that kind of motion extrapolation gone wild, uh, uncalibrated, but very helpful for us, even if not for the visual system. The third one is a, another a second example where motion is helpful and is being used to try to offset or discount the effects of motion on the world. And it's when uh, frames move. Well, or the world. Okay, so the question to address here is why the world looks stable when we move our eyes around. So every time we move our eyes, which is maybe three times a second, um, the image being sent to our brain shifts like in a terrible, shaky Blair Witch, whatever that was, camera um, sequence. But we don't see that. I mean, you would if you had a visual video camera and you should go look at its picture, it doesn't look very good. Uh, but our uh, brain seems to have some kind of steady cam that gets over this. And that's the puzzle of visual stability. How does that work? So we're gonna show that the motion of the background is really probably a really important contributor here. So here's a typical summer cottage in, um, in Ontario, Canada. And here me uh, moving 
my eyes across the scene, uh, different locations. <clears throat> and um, that looks fine as I move my eyes around here, but the little the picture that's sent to the brain is changing uh, enormously on each eye movement. And Will is, if you, you know, try moving your eyes around the room, you're getting really different pictures sent to the brain, and yet it seems all very stable. Okay. So the movement of the background may be what is helping here. Every time you move your eyes, the whole background shifts the opposite direction. Perhaps that's it. If you could use that motion and discount it, and this is a very old uh, idea, um, then the positions would be seen of objects relative to the background and somehow the background acts as the, the anchor and stabilizes everything. Um, so this idea that position is seen relative to the frame is a, as I said, a really old one. Here's a, a woman waving goodbye in a, in a train here. I don't know if you can see her hand moving down. Well, you see her hand moving up and down sort of within the framework of the, of the train. But of course, oh, there she goes again. Um, of course, <laughs> there it is. Of course, her hand really is following a sort of sine wave, a sort of snake path as it, as it moves. But we don't see that. We see the, uh, the frame relative position. Oops, stop that. Okay, so that led us to looking at how these frames, how small frames might uh, give us an, an insight into how this process works. So this is with uh, Mark Ozkan, Stuart Ansis, Mary Stahart, and Mark Wexler. And we just take a simple square frame, as you'll see it in a moment on the uh, next movie, square frame moves left and right, and the one side flashes before the motion, the other side flashes after the motion. Well, because it's moving, the location of these two edges actually gets quite close. But what you'll see probably is that they still seem far apart. And in fact, even when you make it move so far that the, the two edges, there's no overlap and the, the right-hand edge here is to the left of the left-hand edge there, you still see them. Okay, so I think you're ready now for the next movie. Uh, so, oh, hang on. We'll get there somehow. Go. Movie five. There we go. Okay. So, uh, let's see if you can, I don't know if you started with me, but it starts very slow and very slowly. And so that you can actually see that the red bar, which is on the, uh, is it to the left of the blue bar? The red bar is on the, this side, boom, and then the blue bar that side. So there's actually an overlap between the end positions of the frame motion. And so the red is physically to the left of the blue. But as the motion picks up, I hope you've got this going now. As the motion picks up, you'll start to see the, the reverse, that the uh, blue is to the left of the red. And then they, the frame will fade out to sh just to show you that's not a trick of the computer. It's in your head. Uh, the two little bars above are the, um, the uh, responses the subject made to try and match the perceived location. And in this case, of course, it was blue to the left of red. <clears throat> now that's a striking effect. That's like a hundred, turns out, I'm oh, sorry. Turns out it's a hundred percent effect, well, virtually a hundred percent effect of the frame motion on the perceived motion. So here are the data, back to the uh, data slides. Now on the left are the settings, the settings the subject made of the spacing between the two bars. Um, so zero meant they said, well, they looked right on top of each other. Uh, this value here, 12.5, was the actual size of the frame. Um, here, here, down here, uh, these numbers here are red seen left of blue, which it physically was in these larger path separations, these, these ones way out here, where it moved like 20 degrees left to right. The frame itself was 12 and a half degrees. So uh, here, red physically is left of blue. Over here, Blue is left of red. Here are the settings. Now, the frame size here, here's the setting. So there's kind of a, a bias. So when, when the, the um, frame is hardly moving at all, uh, people judge the, the frame size to be slightly smaller than it is. And they stay there, no matter what the spacing was, they basically stay at the same value, uh, even though the physical spacings are crossing and going the other way around. Uh, the subjects always see the frame, the blue and, and red spaced by the frame 
by the same distance that they judge the frame to have as a frame width. Sorry, that was a long sentence. Okay, so there's a bit of a paradox here. There's an amazing effect. The edges flash before and after the motion are seen in frame coordinates as if they're on the left and the right of the frame, which of course they are, but they're at different times, one before and one after the motion, as if the frame were stationary, as if it wasn't moving at all. Something's got in there and extracted this frame specific uh, um, relative position. And that's what you see despite, well, I still see the frame moving. Um, so that's a bit of a paradox, but the effect is there. The effect of this frame stabilization is there. And this is what we are interested in and to see how this uh, uh, underlies our, our experience of a stable world as our eyes are moving. So here is a, a second example. So you can go to the next movie, uh, click outside the movie. Oh, that didn't work. Oh, oh yeah, forward, forward. Uh, I should've done that before. Forward, uh, rightward button or downward button uh, on your keyboard will do it. Okay, so these two, um, these two little guys, are actually physically superimposed. And of course, in the zoom version, version, sometimes the flash doesn't show up and the motion is terrible. But on your web version, you should see. Now, not everybody sees this. There are one or two people who report that they don't see this separation, but they don't look right at the two dots. So look a little bit away from the dots or the frame itself or up at the dots below, above, or down at the two targets are always superimposed line below it. And you probably see red and green separated, or red and blue, sorry, separated. And again, the two static dots above are adjusted to represent the perception of this particular participant. And the frame will disappear every now and then to show you that the, these are physically superimposed. Okay, <clears throat> so that's uh, basically a second uh, bite at the apple. Um, here's the uh, stimulus back to the uh, slides. Um, the red, of course the, the frame wasn't red or blue, but this is to help you see which flashes in which relative to which frame. So the flash, uh, uh, first flash is on the here, which is at the right of the frame, which is over the left. Second flash at the exact same location is now on the left of the frame where it has moved to. And the percept is that these two are shifted apart. And here's that illusory shift now as a function of speed. So that's the 10 is the frame shift, the path length, and people's judgments were about 10 all the way across almost a hundredfold uh, range of speed. Now, this is really critical for our um, uh, efforts to link this, if it is true, to the visual stability, because this range of here of speeds that we measured is the saccade range of saccade speeds for a 10 degree uh, saccade. So within and around the saccade range of speeds, this uh, phenomenon holds and is strong. Uh, we also changed the frame size. Um, well, it seems to go down at larger frame sizes, perhaps because the frame is running up against the edges of the, the monitor. We're gonna uh, work with a full screen monitor next. <clears throat> Here's an interesting experiment. We do the same thing, but we, we vary the path length. And notice that the illusory shift here uh, follows the path length almost linearly. And it does so in two conditions, one in which the motion was uh, constant speed, so always the same speed, and then the, the path length could be short or long, uh, or at the same duration. So when it's um, a long path, then it's going quickly or fast, and when it's a short path, it's going much slower. Uh, it doesn't really matter whether it's constant speed or constant duration, it's the path length that determines the shift that was seen. Um, the perception was always shifted by about the same amount. This is with our eight in-person subjects, but it's a pandemic. So we also ran uh, Marius uh, to heart, arranged around uh, hundreds of subjects and we got uh, virtually the same results. But now of course, because it's in different viewing distances and everything, it's in terms of path length, percent path length and illusory shift percent frame width. Uh, I'm sorry, path length in terms of the frame, uh, the frame size itself. <clears throat> okay, so, uh, Shift depends on path length, but not speed. We might ask, well, this is interesting. So uh, in whether or not this is um, a part of the processes that make the world stable as we move our eyes, that remains to be conclusively shown. That's, that's what we're thinking. Um, and our, our interest here is we've got this little um, toy version of visual stability based on a single frame and we'll be able to 
to do um, you know fMRI and EG and all sorts of neat things which we haven't started yet um, based on this very simple version of um, frame stabilization. We might have asked a couple questions and we we tried to answer many of them, but I'll only show you one, for example. Uh, what counts as a frame? So your next movie, uh, right arrow, right shift on your, there, no, oh, I just didn't see it. Okay, here we go, We're movie number seven. Uh, you see these two flashes, always superimposed, and then all of a sudden a whole bunch of uh, dots show up. So we're using a dot background and the question is how many dots are necessary? So first of all, you'll notice now the dots actually aren't moving as much as the frames I was showing you before. So the offset you'll see between red and blue, if you're one of the, uh, if you're among the people who see these shifts, uh, which most do, as long as you don't look directly at the dots, at the red and blue dot, uh, you'll see this uh, offset, you know, about uh, two or three dot widths, I think, according to what I see. And I keep seeing it down to maybe three or two dots. Uh, at one dot, oh, well, one dot is questionable. Okay, so that it doesn't have to be square. It actually doesn't have to be anything in particular, just lots of stuff in the background moving and lots of stuff even down to two or three dots appear to trigger this uh, motion correction, motion discounting uh, operation. Okay, so conclusions uh, from the frame motion. Uh, so remember what we looked at here is uh, there are two flashes and one is before and one is after the frame moves. And that's uh, sort of a simulation of what happens in the real world when you're looking at an object before and then after your eyes move, it's moved on, on your retina, but doesn't seem to move in the world. So this relative position of a test flash before and after the frame is stabilized is, is kind of related to that. Oh, I'm sorry, there've been some questions coming up. Um, Yes, and I, I didn't notice that. So let me see. Yeah, but maybe, uh, they, okay. I thought they could. Yeah. We tried adding an audio shift. Sorry, I'm looking at the chat at the chat window here, um, which if you could open yours, you'll see the same ones. Have you tried to add an audio shift, like a Doppler effect? Um, oh, I don't know. Oh, okay, audio, yes. There are some things, you know, with, with um, moving dots where the sound of a collision helps you see them as bouncing off each other. Um, uh, we haven't tried to change the audio with the moving frame. I don't know what that would do. Uh, but I, I first thought your question was, can we produce this frame effect in audio? So maybe there's a, an audio scene like Al Bregman like, and it goes you know, like a, a drum set and a whole uh, stereo uh, re record scene and it moves left and right and then there's a click that happens as your audio scene is moving left and right. Will that click, if it clicked once before the whole, you, you moved your whole stereo set and then clicks once after you moved your whole stereo set, even though it was clicked in the same location, will it appear to be offset? So that would be kind of a fun audio version. Dominique, hi Dominique, asks, what happens if there's only one object but is larger than, static, <clears throat> than a static dot? Okay, well, if we go back to the, okay, all of the, okay, the, there's a big change here in uh, our experiments compared to the uh, experiments almost a hundred years ago by um, Dunker and uh, later by Wallach, um, who also looked at these effects of frames. Many people have looked at effects of frames on, on orientation, on uh, position of the horizon. There's a, there's a huge literature here. Uh, but the, 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 the most relevant ones were the Dunker and the Wallach. Um, and Dunker in particular did have a static dot and the frame effect he got on the static dot was kind of small. And for that, the motion had to be almost at threshold level. Okay, so what we did that made a, a vast difference in the size of these effects is rather than having a static dot, we had a flash dot, flash once before the motion, once after. Um, and at the speeds we're looking at, the Dunker effect for a static dot is nothing. There is no effect whatsoever. Uh, but as soon as you make it flash, there's an enormous effect. Okay, so what happens if there's only one object but is larger than static dot? Well, that's kind of what we did with our one object was the square and it's larger than the static dot, and even though it's just a little bit larger. Uh, for a static dot, nothing happens in any case, but if it's a flash dot, even the square, no matter what size, 
will will make this offset occur. Larger, but not oh, a, a square. Uh, yeah, okay. A flash, but not moving. And uh, okay, yes. So it yes, if if there's an offset uh, um, square, uh, it's sometimes there's an effect outside the the moving square. Um, let's say the square is moving up and down and the flash is here, you can sometimes get effects. They drop pretty quickly outside the moving square because remember there's a static frame of the monitor nearby. If you got rid of that, perhaps the effect would be more general. So we, we, we are going to test that. Uh, so yes, okay. Um, okay. Okay, so uh, we got the relative uh, positions of test flash before and after the frame like are stabilized, even if the frame is seen to move. Quite sure what that means yet. Yeah. The relative position being stabilized is very important to us. The fact that you still see the frame moving, of course, it doesn't move as much. It moves about a third as much, between a half and a third as much. So it is, its motion is somehow, moving things are somehow seen as less dynamic than they really are. That's been shown a number of times, but they're still moving. And yet the positions of flashes are seen as if it were not moving at all. Okay, so there is some, we hope a link, I hope, well, there may or may not be. And if there is, this would be an excellent way of studying this basic puzzle of visual uh, processing that the world stays stable. This is a, a major sophisticated uh, operation by the brain to be able to stabilize the world despite having moving sensors. <clears throat> now, where does this happen? Okay, as I said, we haven't started there yet. We don't, we do not know. So we're gonna start some fMRI and some EEG. We'll be able to say some, a bit more uh, next year. Overall conclusions, motion helps to locate things. I gave two examples where it really helps. One is when something's moving uh, linearly and you see a bit head and that helps you make a saccade to it. Um, but that's a very uh, short lived, um, <clears throat> short uh, extrapolation, about a tenth of a second. And also when the back of the, um, when, when the whole background is moving, that seems to help us. Uh, um, well, of course, in the case of this frame moving on our display, this is kind of an illusion. This, we see these uh, flashes as being separated when they physically aren't. So that's not really uh, uh, helpful. It's actually uh, in conflict with the physical uh, situation, but we do think it is part of the system that stabilizes the world as our eyes move. So in that sense, it's a sort of uh, a, version, a small version of it that's kind of gone wild on this, this uh, moving frame where it shouldn't have, but does. And stabilize object relative to frames. On the, the middle case, we looked at double drift. Well, motion was, was not really helpful at all. It was gone wild. It had, uh, move things far from where they would be useful. If you went to point at it, you make a big mistake. Uh, intriguingly, when you go to look at it, you get there correctly. And that double sort of brain, two brains in one, uh, let us um, track down, uh, even though it wasn't helpful to our visual system, it did help us locate conscious perception in an area outside, surprisingly outside the visual system. Um, so uh, sort of one little anecdote to, to underscore the point that this is um, a, an odd percept because it's rarely encountered is that uh, two of our um, main experimenters after several months of uh, testing themselves, you know, hundreds of times per day, thousands and thousands of times overall, uh, got less and less of an effect. So we haven't done this um, explicitly yet. So that, uh, that's, that's only an anecdote. But we do think that the brain uh, will eventually, or at least this late leads us to think the brain eventually will um, calibrate to these uh, doubly moving targets uh, if they were frequent enough. Uh, although, of course, then that will be of no use to the normal world where this doesn't really happen very often. Okay, well, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh... Patrick, and I want to invite everybody to unmute yourself and uh, give a big applaud. Um, it's been a wonderful uh, talk. And I want to open the stage for questions. Anybody who, um, I mean, I also have myself a few, but uh, there are a few in the chat as well. Do you want me to read them to you or do you want me? To... I see I see one from Katrina, Karen, and Mehdi. Okay, yeah. so Katrina asks also about audio, uh, two dots. 
Do you think adding a single sound at the moment of overlap? Uh, uh, okay, I'm trying to think of that in my mind. Uh, I, I imagine uh, the idea there is that the audio cue is going to try and help localize the flashes because the audio and the sound uh, and the vision will, will try and synchronize in terms of location, kind of like a, uh, a ventriloquist effect or something, anti-ventriloquist. Um, maybe, uh, or possibly the single sound might be mislocalized as well. So I think that interaction between the two senses is a pretty interesting direction. So it's a great question. I don't, uh, well, I can't do that. I can't do that experiment in my mind, so I can't really say. Okay, Karen. Ah, yes, patients with a kinotopsia. Well, not many of them. Um, the uh, German woman with a kinotopsia is not, is no longer uh, available. Um, and, <clears throat> but that would be interesting. Uh, well, first of all, if, if you have, the like kinetopsia is like the smooth motion. Um, it's not perceived as smooth motion, and uh, you sort of get a saccade, uh, you know, strobic, uh, strobed version of locations. Um, I think uh, I think that's a good point. I think those those people uh, would would not see the illusion, would not, all, nor would they get the motion extrapolation from that very first, uh, like the, the flash lag and so on. Um, and you can do, you can make uh, motion blindness just by making the stimuli uh, equiluminous, uh, red and green uh, matched, uh, matched to the background gray, let's say. A and in that case, you would not see motion. And uh, clearly, we, we would not expect any position offset. So we could check that very quickly. So that would be my prediction. I think that would be interesting to look at. But I think if you take the motion away, which appears to be the agent for these uh, illusions uh, or corrections, if you want to say there. Yeah? Uh, then I don't think you would find it anymore. Okay, Mehdi, does the frame effect relate to color decomposition? Oh, that's such a lovely effect. <clears throat> okay, so maybe you, you know or don't know uh, one of uh, uh, Romy Nijiwan's other uh, excellent demonstrations. He has a moving disc, I'm um, oh, sorry, he had a moving bar uh, going along. And then at some point he flashes, the bar, the bar itself is green there's a moving green bar, he flashes a, a red bar on top of the green. So physically it's yellow, but because of the separation of the move, moving object and the flash, the flash lag effect, you report seeing a red bar, which has never been on your retina. So that's a very nice example. Um, and now the question then is, is, this move, is the effect of the moving bar uh, like the frame effect? And that's something we have been working on a lot is the, are the first set, the frame, the uh, flash lag and the flash grab and all, all those things where there's a moving pattern and a position offset, are they the same as the frame effect? Well, they seem awfully similar, you have to admit, in many, many ways. However, the data argue against our, our uh, logic. So there's something going on there. The simple, simplest data that separates the two I already mentioned was one is the the, the speed effect. You saw how the speed, there was virtually no speed effect on the uh, frame effect. It was flat across a huge range of speeds. And that's not true for the flash lag or the flash grab. They're all you know, speed dependent uh, up to point at which they saturate. So um, yes, are, are they the same or different? Good question. Uh, I think they're different. I'm forced to think they're different by, based on the data based on the sort of nature of the phenomena, you think they'd be more closely related. You know? So we're not, not quite sure how that's gonna work out, but uh, I think they are uh, going to be different things. Okay. Josh, shouldn't the decoder work well on brain regions responsible for preparing um, the observer's response? Uh, correlation between individual difference to latency and field I'm not sure what you mean by field dependence. The, the field dependence is in the um, rod and frame effect. They found that the size depends on personality. Exactly. Okay. So <clears throat> there is there's a big literature from I can't remember that's the forties or when on rod and frame effect. Uh, something that um, Mike Morgan loves. 
uh, where you tilt the frame and it, you now you have to adjust the rod to something vertical. And the, um, the, 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 the amount you adjusted is variable across people. And this was linked to different people's personality. So I think that's what you're saying. Now, that's a bit while I was, why I was asking if somebody, some people did not see the illusion for the superimposed red and blue dots as the frame moved back and forth. So we might be able to find some variability. So far, not much, but there might be some in the effects of the frame. <coughs> uh, and um, if so, uh, we, we could link back to the ancient uh, frame, uh, run frame uh, dependence, field dependence effects. Um, this seems to be more uh, consistent across subjects. Although, as I said, we have found a few, perhaps they were looking at the red and green dots, red and blue dots directly, which you should not do. Or perhaps there is an interpersonal uh, difference uh, that could be interesting to follow up on. Okay, so. Um, uh, Patrick, can I ask a question? Patrick? Uh, hang on, yes. Uh, I guess it's working if you have maybe a repetition, but if you just show only one try, does it work? So is it something yeah. to do? Yes, okay, so that's a good point, Yuri. Uh, everything I showed you are these repetitive back and forth stuff because that was very easy for the subjects to use a method of adjustment um, settings. Uh, but we also have done a whole series of experiments with a, what we call one shot. So bang, bang. Uh, and then there's a long pause and then bang, bang again. So two positions uh, or either slow drift, but mostly we do the just a, a parent motion, one spot, second spot. Uh, and we get the same strength of effects for the single direction, one uh, pass only. But if you mix it in uh, many different conditions, is it still going to work without, uh, if the subject cannot make any prediction about the location? Uh, can you say that all again? I was uh, asking if you like uh, mix a few condition of moving target to different location, is it still going to work? Oh yeah, yeah, yes. That's in our article. Sorry, I didn't. I don't have that on the set of movies. That's a very good one. So yes, we do have, and yes, it does work. So we we have the case of two frames uh, going opposite directions, and flashes within each, and at the same time, while you're fixating between the two, you get these large separations. All four flashes are at the same uh, horizontal line, but they are they appear to be uh, dragged up and down away from them, in two directions at the same time by two separate frames. So that in obviously would seem to have nothing to do with visual stability. We only, the whole idea of visual stability is the whole world as one moves. And yet we get this evidence of this frame effect, as you say, uh, occurring locally for two different frames going different directions. Um, so either, the, either, either this in fact has nothing to do with visual stability, which would be unfortunate or or the algorithms underlying this frame correction are in fact um, uh, relatively local. Because remember, our, our moving frame was inside a static order frame and still worked. So, so there may be some local aspect to this algorithm. Certainly two of them can work at once. Um, and we should keep that in mind when we try and uh, make uh, extensions of it to um, visual stability when the eyes move. And of course, there's only one moving frame. Maybe that could, uh, they could move two eyes separately and still see two. No, that, okay, that won't happen. Uh, hang on, we were at uh, um, Peter. Peter can't stay. Okay, well, he's in Australia, so. Uh, Karen. Uh, okay. Hi, hi from Munich. Hi, hi back. Um, you showed where perception is tricked, but not the eyes. Are the cases where the eyes are also tricked? Uh, yes, okay, so the, <clears throat> the frame effect, we believe will also trick the eyes. This is the experiment we're, we're starting to run right now. The original um, uh, motion-induced uh, uh, position shifts, like the flash lag or the flash grab, those affect the eyes as much as perception. So the, um, the, the one I told you about, the double drift that affects perception, but not the eyes, is, stands out as a really a unique and uh, an opportunity uh, that gives us a real insight into how things work. Be just because 
the eyes are not tricked and therefore we believe the attention is not tricked and that sort of gets attention away from the, the whole uh, question. So that's of, the rare case. It's not the, the usual case that the eyes are tricked, not, not this is the... Okay. Uh, yeah, the standard case. Well, of course, I mean, the idea is, you know, what we see is what we move our eyes to, the eyes and uh, the eyes and perception always should be linked <clears throat> or, or what are eyes for, right? <clears throat> the action, the, the purpose of perception is to drive action. And if there is a difference, we would certainly uh, over evolutionary time uh, uh, get rid of the people who had this difference. So this one illusion where there is a difference between eyes and perception is unique and a real opportunity that we've tried to exploit. Um, okay, Katrina. Uh, asynchrony in motion perception. Oh yeah, okay. Okay, uh, for those of you who don't know, Katrina is referring to um, Mutusis and um, what's his name? Exactly, and uh, Professor Zeki, Semir Zeki. Zeki, um, there we go, yes. Uh, where uh, if uh, you have a moving to the left at red and moving to the right as green, left, red, right, green, you get this desynchronization between or this, this, um, this delay between the uh, color and the motion and the color switches first. You see the color exactly. switch before the motion. That's what I had in, okay. in mind. Yeah, so that's an interesting point. In our case, the, the color was only a flash and, and there may certainly be some kind of phase lag between the flash registration and the motion switch in our repetitive ones. And we could, we could look at the, if there is a slight lag there uh, or lead, there, there might be, um, but whatever the lag or lead is, it, it still allowed us to see a 100% illusion. And, you know, for those of us who uh, tried to use illusions to study the visual system, 100% illusion is kind of the, the holy grail and, and that was it. Okay, Lucia. Thank you. Oh my goodness, hi. Uh, I'm not going to be in Italy. Uh, after that, uh, I might be in, in, in France in the fall. Maybe you'll be there. Uh, nice to see your name. I don't know where you are here. Okay, uh, any other questions? I think uh, I covered all the ones in the chat. Yeah, um, I do have a question, Patrick, and I want to ask about the illusion. I mean, the illusion happens when everything is actually within a 2D screen at the same uh, distance, and although there is... Uh, a brief presentation, I mean, temporal, let's say, dissociation, and the color is supposed to differentiate the, let's say, the targets from the moving items. Still, this is very well within, uh, it's, it's sort of, I'm thinking that it's sort of maybe easy to bind the actual target and the moving object around it. Um, and I'm wondering if you think in a 3D environment, not that I have precisely the, um, this would also be the case or, um, I, I mean, is it maybe a consequence of the fact that the visual system is very, uh, it's difficult for it to separate that when it's in a very kind of like uh, perceptual mode in a 2D plane versus what mm -hmm. it's usually dealing with is motion within a 3D environment. Right, right. Well, what you're getting at is the key point of the first and third illusions is that the, the um, flash is somehow bound to the motion. Somehow it seems to belong to the motion. And you're asking, well, what about if the flash were some, in a different depth plane? Um, yeah. Uh -huh. <clears throat> or, uh, well, I guess that's the best. Um, I mean, they're already different colors, so they sort of would segregate on the base of color and they're different shapes. Uh, so the, the only real thing to ask next uh, is um, what, what about depth? Uh, so we've done a few things with depth, not enough to really answer your question definitively. Um, uh, so we, we have presented the frames in depth. Um, okay, so I, I really can't say uh, yet. What we want to do is have the frame move forward and backward, for example, mm -hmm. to see whether you get the flash effect in depth. And we're pretty sure you do. Uh, one thing we did was we just took the monitor and tilted it. So now the motions are in depth towards you and away from you. And the flash uh, does, of course, move in the depth of the monitor plane. Yeah. <clears throat> but that's different from having the, the, the uh, frame and the flash at actual different depth planes. So we'll get back to you when we know the answer. 
uh, as um, uh, someone asked before, if you put, uh, I can't remember, if you put the flash outside the frame, there's a certain fall off of the effectiveness of the frame. And perhaps that's true in depth as well. Although perhaps because it's still enclosed, uh, it, it might still be effective even at very different depth planes. So good question and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, well, you can try it yourself. You saw how simple these, ex these experiments are. Uh, and, and I can, uh, if, I, if we get to the answer before you do, I'll, I'll say No, that. I'm not gonna pursue it myself. <laughs> okay. I assume I will. Uh, yeah, um, I have another question, although I'm not sure that uh, this is even in the scope of your answer, but maybe uh, you did mention the issue that mo in the beginning of the talk that most of the investigations are done on the perceptual aspects. And, uh, and then for example, you showed the video with uh, Nadal and um, I'm wondering, uh, there is not a lot of uh, research being done on a naturalistic, uh, let's say naturalistic observers outside the lab. And I wonder if the um, information processing in the visual system related to, for example, uh, following moving targets and uh, all sorts of motion um, cues may be different when people are actually dynamic, you know, the body is actually moving. I mean, most mm. of the investigations have been done when people are more, more or less seated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just... Um, yeah, so you could imagine, um, uh, well, I mean, one thing is, of course, you're driving your car and you're, you're being transported. You're not, you're not the source of, the, well, you're not directly the source of the motion. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> I, I think these processes uh, would, would work or are still at work with all the frames around you as you are moving around in your car. But imagine um, instead of eye movements, uh, it's a head movement. <clears throat> so you're, you're kind of saying, what would happen to uh, locations of flashes if I flash something here and flash something there? I, I'm not, I don't have the world. I just have my head motion. It's in total darkness, let's say. Uh, these are things we're interested in studying with Mark Wexler in, in Paris. Uh, he has a nice dark room and some LEDs and so on. <clears throat> And nor actually what happens, well, I give you a hint of what happens. If you do, if you do any of these in, in darkness, not much, not much stabilization happens. So even, um, even just eye movements in darkness and single flashes, of course, are, are uh, completely mislocated. Uh, it, it, it's the wow. background that produces the anchoring um, and it has to be visible. Uh, so the eye movements alone don't correct themselves. <clears throat> so, um, Yes, uh, well, I think there's Peter Maidendorp who does lots of nice things and people sitting in sleds and moving around and also uh, Lawrence Harris uh, here at York. Um, uh, I'll talk to them. I don't, I don't know that they... Just, um, it was just a conceptual question. It's not yeah. that... Uh, well, I would hope these same processes are active even when we are being dynamic, when we are moving around because that's, of course, the natural setting where we have to cope with the effects of our eye movements. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm thinking maybe, maybe, maybe they're even more efficient than we know them to be. Uh, possibly. You know, I don't know. Possibly in a Faster. dynamic setting, there's, there's a lot of other, there's a higher noise background, and, and so that their, their effect on us is even larger, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, um, are there any more questions? Um, well, anyway, even if there are, uh, <laughs> I'd like to thank you a lot for a very inspiring talk and active, um, yeah, interactive and uh, yeah, uh, lovely. And thanks a lot for joining us. It was a pleasure. So again, okay. thanks a lot for joining our seminar. Yeah. Um, and I want to say that next week we'll have Elizabeth uh, Quinlan with us um, at the same time. Um, she was here, but I'm not sure that she's. Um, um, so see you next week at the same time. And thanks again, Patrick, for a lovely talk. Okay. Well, thank you. Good to see you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you.